So let's pray. Lord God, we come before you now wishing that we could see your face, but uncertain whether our lives would have brought you joy or exasperation. Father, forgive our sins and cleanse us now so that our time of worship might please you. Amen. Well, our first song says something that we can only aspire to. It will be true in eternity for us, but we struggle to fulfill it while we live this life. And it says, I will worship with all of my heart. How I wish it were true. Well, please stand if you're able and we'll sing. aspirations true for you, uh, even if the, the practice is hard for us to do. Well, uh, Malk, it's over to you. If you can get up, that is, bro. On! <laughs> oh, good morning, everybody. Is there anything that you really, really want? Or really, really want it? You can answer. It's not. Yes. A Fitbit? 
I'm not making no comments. <laughs> Anybody else got anything? I mean, adults, what is something that you really want? I know there's two things I really want. One of them is to get rid of this. An orange shirt. <laughs> Wanted or want. <laughs> you know, we got it. Well, I'm going to tell you a story now about uh, two different people. And the first thing I want you to do is remember the, the, the year 1973. Okay, can you remember that? 1973, don't forget. And this uh, story starts off way back in time, back in the first few pages, the first few chapters of the Bible. It involves a, a priest called Eli, Eli the priest. Now, one day, Eli the priest was on duty and it comes to the time of the yearly sacrifices and gifts to the temple of God and there was a man turned up with his wife Hannah not that Hannah <laughs> this is a long time ago and his name was Elkanah no <laughs> and Hannah really wanted something she so desperately wanted something now, for years, God had been quiet. He'd not said anything. People hadn't heard his voice for a long time. And this, this lady came, to, came to, the, to the area of the church where she was allowed to go, and she was praying so hard, so hard. And her mouth was moving, but her lips, she wasn't any making any sound. It was all coming from her heart. It was so desperate she was. And anyway, the priest went up to him and says, what's up with you? Go back home and get yourself sorted out. And she says, my Lord, I just want you to, I just want something from God. So he says, well, whatever you want, he'll give it to you. Do you know what she wanted? She wanted a child because she hadn't got any children. And she was too old. She was too old to have any children. But she so desperately wanted one. Well, you know something, God heard her prayer. And she had a baby and she was so overjoyed. She says, I'm going to, wait. I don't, I don't know, when is, when is a child weaned? What? I'm a man, I don't know these things. <laughs> Anybody got any ideas? Three months, uh, maybe a bit longer, I don't know. But she said to God, she promised, you know, she would promised God that she'd, she'd do, do anything that he gave her if she gave her a child. So she promised to give the child to God, to let him serve God. And that's what he did. When she was, when she was weaned, he went into the temple to work with Eli. Now, who, have we got any fast runners here today? Have we got any fast runners? Are you a fast runner? No, because I, you used to be, well, I really need a child. <laughs> yeah, go on then, you, you come over. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, yeah, yeah. Come, 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 come. I want two of you. I want two of you. Two, another one, just one more. Yeah, okay. Too late, you've had your chance. Okay, what I want you to do, I want you to go down to the doors, and when you hear the word Samuel, I want you to come running. Okay? So if you go down to the doors, and the first one to get here, right, is going to be the winner. The only thing is, you got to say to me, what do you want? Okay, well, it was one night, very quiet, and the boy, not yet, he was in the temple sleeping, and Eli the priest was in his quarters sleeping, and then Samuel heard a voice. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. What did he say? What did you, what do you want? Yes, that's right, go back, go back. <laughs> And Eli woke up and he says, I, I don't want anything. Oh, what, 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 what are you doing here? It's too early in the morning. 
So go back, go back to bed. So the boy uh, went back to bed. And then a little while later, Samuel heard his voice. Oh, what do you want? What do you want? And so Eli woke up again. He goes, oh, oh, this is getting stupid. This, I'm not wanting anything. I'm trying to sleep. Go back to your room. Go back to your room, go on. Oh, you're so... Oh, how long is this going to go on for? Right? <laughs> well, he went back to bed again, and all was quiet. Then all of a sudden, he heard the voice again. The voice said, Samuel! Uh, yeah, great. What Samuel said. What do you like? And Eli said, nothing, but I think there's something else here. Okay, I think you two can now sit down. I've got some sweets for you. Okay, thank you for helping me. Eli he realised that it wasn't him who wanted something. It was God. Samuel heard the voice of God. And he came running to see. And he says, Eli, it's not me. It's somebody else. So this child that was so desperately wanted was now hearing God. Isn't that fantastic? What's 1973 got to do with that story? Well, in 1973, I was 12, no, yeah, I was 13 years old, was I? Yeah, 12. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad somebody's had a ball here, yeah. <laughs> I was 12. And I thought, and we'd just been to the play scheme holiday club at Rowling School. Had a great time. And two of my friends said, there's another holiday club happening at the church. Why don't we go? And I said, Oh, no, I'm too tired. I'm too tired. I don't want to go to that. And they came back to that, that, that day and said, oh, it was great. We were singing songs. We were running around. We went on trips. Also, all right, I'll come then. So I went, I came and joined in the holiday club here. And we all got on a bus. There was about 60 of us on a small bus. We went to Beakerdill. We had a great time. And then we, we went on a bus and we went to see the bad vicar who got a railway in his back garden. It was great. And we sang and we made things. And because of that, I started coming to church. Now, I didn't really know about Jesus. I knew from school, you know, when religious education is taught to you. Well, I knew about God, I knew about Jesus. I didn't know anything about them. I know they, they were there. I knew at Christmas, we got presents. And at Easter, three months later, we got chocolate. Loads of chocolate. Too much chocolate, really. And that's as much as I knew. Well, I was coming to this church, and, some, and then there was a camp came up. Not like the camp that Pete runs. This was a bit more sedate. And we had a, we were invited to go. Well, somebody, I, we, our family couldn't afford it, but somebody paid for us to go. And we went to that camp. And you know something? At that camp, I heard God. Not Mal, but I knew he was saying something in my heart that I needed to know. And because of that, I realized that Jesus was a real person. God was fantastic. He was doing all these magical things and wonderful things. And he wanted me to be a member of his family. And so I accepted Jesus into my heart. And then in 2000, no, sorry, in 1976, I was baptized. And, it, it, so, and that's where my story started. So, like Samuel, he hears the voice of God. I heard the stirrings of God in my heart. I felt it. And because of that, I became a Christian. And I'm following God. And still do. I've had a few blips. 
you know, we're not all, you know, always great, but I had a few, but I'm still here. And that's great, isn't it? So let's just say a little prayer, okay? I'm going to lean on this pillow for a minute. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you for those uh, words that we hear that stir our hearts. Lord, thank you for that story of, of Samuel and Elijah, and, and Eli, sorry. And the, the words that uh, he spoke and the words that you used through Samuel to, to teach that nation, Lord. So, Lord, I just want to thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you, Lord, for, for saving me. And I hope people, elder, everybody else here can say that, that they have heard your word. Amen. Amen. Oh, by the way, the story didn't end there. Because although Hannah had the child and no one gave it away, God blessed her and gave her more children. So it wasn't just one thing. It was quite a lot. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's sing again. And uh, it's... God, you're good to me. So hopefully it's one that the, the, the children know as well. That's the truth for all who trust in Jesus, isn't it, Mal? God, you're good to me. God, you're good to me. You gave me life and set me free. seated all except the kids time for you to go
Well, before we bring the world before God in prayer, let's turn our eyes on how much God has done for us. And, and the song is, Look and See Our God. Song. But there's a couple of announcements, first of all. 
and then we're going to pray about them. So Pete thought it was worth having the announcements linked to the to the prayers, which is a good idea, because that's often why we give announcements, isn't it? Not just to let you know it's happening, but so that uh, you can pray uh, for it. So one of the announcements, and those that have had an email should have, um, or on the email should have uh, read this, if you've got around to checking your emails. Um, there are a number of people in Corn who've come from Ukraine already. There's about 18 individuals that are in Corn, Barrow, or Woodhouse Eaves. Um, and there's a group in Quorn um, that's being organized by a man called Byron, who some of you might know, that's trying to sort of coordinate things and trying to help them get to know each other, because many of them don't know each other, because the way in which people have come generally has been somebody putting forward their home to be a host, contacting the government, contacting somebody somehow, and then them, them coming. There isn't any sort of coordination. And Ian was quite keen that we as a church became part of the sort of coordination, the, the, uh, the village-wide and area-wide coordination and, and support um, for these people. So next Saturday, a week yesterday, we're going to have a coffee morning here in the hall, actually, uh, for both the hosts and the visitors from the Ukraine. Okay, so the main reason for telling you that is so that you pray. Okay, so these are people, as you know, who will have had horrific experiences. They'll be carrying a lot of things with them. They need the Lord Jesus. Some of them might already be Christians. Some of them probably aren't. As far as I'm aware, most of the hosts aren't because they're the people that we've met. So they're people who really need the Lord. And as Malk um, said, that's the most important thing that they hear his voice. So do pray for us next Sunday morning. And also, if anybody is really, really keen to bake cakes, and some of you are wonderful bakers, then we don't need masses and masses and masses of cakes. But, you know, some cakes would be nice um, to be able to share with them as well. So don't go out and buy any cakes, because that's fine. They can buy them in the shops. But um, if you'd like to cook a cake, cook a cake, bake a cake, then have a word with me or Jenny, right, for next uh, week. And also, they've, they've asked us to organise um, some opportunity for people to get some clothes, okay? This is not an opportunity to get rid of those clothes that are falling apart or you do not like or have got massive stains on them or whatever else, okay? Let's be honest. What would you want to do if you were going into another country? Yeah, you wouldn't want to wear cast-offs, but you'd be quite happy if there was some nearly new stuff that was there that for some reason is being passed on. So if you have any clothes, either children's or adults' clothes like that, then please, again, have a word with Jenny or myself. So that's the first thing about... Um, Quorn Homes coffee morning um, for Ukrainian visitors. The second thing, also for prayer, is to do with the Jubilee weekend, and we've been asked by the Quorn organisers to, to run with the United Church a, an open air, okay? So there are some posters out in the, in the foyer. We're calling it Rise Up and Serve. Rise Up and Serve is the title of a song that's been written specifically for the Jubilee weekend. Okay, Graham Kendrick and Rend Collective, if, if you know those names, um, have written a song, and it's a song the children are learning in school, as far as I know, as well, which is great. So we call it Rise Up and Serve, and that will be the theme. So in Stafford Orchard, four o'clock on the Sunday. So again, pray for that, please. Quite a few of our key uh, open airers, shall we call them, are not going to be here, either because they're away for the weekend, or they've got street parties in their own street, Okay. So please come as well as pray, because it would be really sad, wouldn't it, if we declare God's glory on the, week of the weekend of the Jubilee, and we talk about the faith of our Queen, and we talk about all the things that have happened, and there's half, and a, half and a dozen of us, you know, congregating in the park. Wouldn't that be sad? Because what does that say about the glory of God? So please consider though that for your prayers and your support. Thank you for that. There are posters out there you can take, put them um, in your windows, wherever. You might want to wait a week or so because that's a couple of weeks off. But please do that and invite people um, to that. So let's pray. To him be the glory for all he has done. Praise to the Father who gave us his Son, a ransom for many. He bled and died, then rose in victory, enthroned on high. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that we do come to the glorious almighty God this morning. And we do come because of the Lord Jesus Christ, an advocate with the Father. 
the righteous one. We thank you for the Lord Jesus as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Lord, we come this morning to share in communion, to remember the Lord Jesus Christ as that atoning sacrifice. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that our sins are forgiven because of him and on account of his name. Heavenly Father, we pray that you might open our eyes, that we would see more of you, more of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Malk said, that we would listen for your voice saying whatever you want to tell us. And Lord, we wouldn't just keep thinking it's something else or keep dismissing it. Heavenly Father, help us to listen to you. Father, we do pray for our world. We pray for Ukraine. Lord, such a, a, a sad country, and for Russia too, it's equally sad for lots of different reasons. But Lord, so many people in need of you, in need of your touch. Lord, we thank you for the great number of Christians that are in the Ukraine. But Lord, we pray for them and we pray for their safety. We pray, Lord, for those that are hurting. We pray for those that are grieving. We pray for those that are injured. We pray for those that are trapped, that are uh, having to stay in, in, uh, in shelters underground. Lord, for those that, are, uh, that effectively are trapped in this, in this amazing power station with all those underground uh, tunnels. Lord, we just lift up that nation. We pray that you would put your hand on the individuals there. And we pray, Lord, for the Christians that you would keep them safe, but also, Lord, that you'd use them at this difficult time to reach out to others, to show your love, to rise up and serve, Lord, as so many of them are doing. And we pray, Lord, for those Ukrainians that have come to the UK, either as members of family, extended members of, of a family, or just people coming to the UK and uh, and, and bringing their families with them, often, Lord, uh, mums with their children, sometimes grandparents. Lord, we do pray for them, and we pray for those that have been willing to open their homes as hosts. We pray that you might bless them. And, Lord, we pray for us as a church as we seek to be involved in that. Lord, we pray not just that we would give physical help, but, Lord, that we would be a spiritual um, support too. Lord, we pray for eternal fruit as a result of this really horrible situation. Lord, we do claim uh, Romans 8.28, and we claim that, that promise that in all things you would work for the good of those that love you and are called according to your purpose. Lord, we pray that you would act in this case. And we pray, Lord, for other regions of the world that are at war where there's conflict. Lord, so many that don't hit our news because they're a bit further away or they've been going on too long, and we lift them up to you. Pray, Lord, that you'd help us to listen to what you're saying to us as you call our name and point things out and Lord as we realize about wars and rumors of wars help us to think what, about what you're saying help us to remember the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ Lord and help us to be ready help us to have that as a focus for our lives Heavenly Father we pray for people in Buffalo in the US Lord that shooting 10 people dead Lord, we pray for their families and friends who are mourning. We pray for uh, the man, I, I think he's still alive, that, that did the shooting, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just pray for him. We can't understand why someone would do that. But Lord, we do pray for him. And we pray for that country, such a, a great country in so many ways. So many Christians in that country. And yet, a, a Lord, a country with a gun culture that just almost offers itself up to these horrific things happening. Lord, we pray for them and we pray again for Christians, for churches to support people, particularly in Buffalo. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would indeed be with us in these things and help us to remember you. Lord, we pray for our missionaries. Thank you for the missionaries that we support uh, in various different countries. Particularly today, Lord, we pray um, uh, for Estelle. Lord, retired, um, hardly, but back in France. Lord, still serving you. We pray for her. We pray for this Bible study that started in her home, uh, Bible study in Arabic, and we pray that that would continue and would bear fruit. We pray for uh, the, the stuff that she's doing in the market, where they're reaching out in evangelism in the market. We pray for, pray you, pr we praise you rather for that uh, replacement card, for the residence card that has been stolen. We pray for her health issues. We pray that you would keep her in good health. 
And we pray, Lord, for that intended trip to Japan, that you would make that possible too. We commit her to you. We thank you for her. And Lord, we pray for our church. We pray that you would help us to love each other and not the world. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, if we have anything as conflict between ourselves, Lord. And Lord, you know I'm not praying this about something specific here, Lord, but we're human beings, we're sinners. We make mistakes. Lord, we lift ourselves up to you and we pray you'd help us to keep short accounts with you and short accounts with each other. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to love each other and it's by our love for each other that others will know that we're Christians and others will know of you. And Lord, we pray for those in great need in our church, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual need. And Lord, just in these moments of silence, Lord, we um, just pray as we um, offer up in our hearts names of people that are on our hearts who need you particularly at this time. So just feel free in your hearts to do that uh, as we have a moment of silence. Heavenly Father, we pray too for our witness in the village as a church, as the services. We pray for um, the QUC as well. And Lord, we pray for witness in other ways. We pray for those people who are in, uh, in clubs and societies and meet up with other people in the village. Lord, we pray for this coffee morning and the opportunities there with the Ukrainian visitors and their hosts. We pray for the upcoming open air as well and opportunities, Lord, just to share you uh, with our neighbours. We pray too for ourselves here. We pray for Sunday Club, for the children and young people, the people who are helping and teaching them. We pray for the other activities through the week. We thank you for them. We pray for our pastor, Ian, on his sabbatical. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless him, give him that really special time with you. Finally, Lord, we lift again Pete to you. Thank you for him being able to preach uh, throughout May. And Lord, we just pray that you would use him this morning. Pray that you would use him to speak to us through your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that we would listen to you speaking. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the reading today is uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 17 verses, and uh, Heather's coming to read for us. Um, the reading can be found on page 1225 of the um, Church Bibles. It's 1 John chapter 2, starting at the first verse. <clears throat> My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin... We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands <clears throat> is a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness 
and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes and the boastings of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Amen. What's it important enough in your life to boast about? Is it what Jesus Christ did for you as he hung upon the cross? You're going to stand again and sing, my worth is not in what I own. Um, 
week, we had that wonderful verse in chapter 1, uh, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so we start this um, chapter 2 saying, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defence, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. John isn't saying that we can feel free to sin because God will forgive us if we confess. On the contrary, what we have been told should encourage us to fight against sin. You know, there are times when we've sinned that we can think, oh, I've failed. Why bother continuing to struggle against sin? I give up. Well, John is encouraging us that failure isn't the end. God understands. And that's why he has made it that we can so readily be forgiven. It's not cheap, but for us, it's easy. Costs God a lot. And when we do sin, God hasn't left us alone. He knows that while we live on earth, we will sin. And so he has given us the support of one who mediates with God, Jesus Christ, whose very presence in heaven is a reminder that there is no condemnation for those in him. Well, now that Satan has been cast out of heaven, which I believe happened when uh, Christ uh, died upon the cross, the only one in heaven who has any right to accuse us is the one who is actually standing up to defend us, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. And he's not one of those lawyers who play the game and then look for loopholes to get people acquitted. No, he is the righteous one. And his defense of us is conclusive and guaranteed to set us free. It is enough for him to say, I have died for this person. Some people have the wrong idea that God the Father is the angry one, and God the Son is the merciful one. Well, that's wrong. God the Father planned our salvation, and that included the Saviour's role as our defence lawyer. Every member of the triune God hates sin. And the wrath of the triune God has been appeased by Christ's death. The Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in this and every matter, and they work together to save us. He, that is Christ, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let me switch this on. Now there are the words. We're thinking today about Christian maturity, and it starts very much with Jesus Christ. Without him, we aren't Christian. We've got no chance. Without him, we're lost. We're on our way to hell. Christian maturity obviously starts when we become a Christian, when Christ comes into our lives. And it says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He has paid for the sins of all who put their trust in him. His sacrifice has appeased God's wrath over our sins. And his death has brought us into a right relationship with God. There's no longer a barrier between us and God. Christ has demolished it. Why then does it say that Christ is also the atoning sacrifice for the whole world? Does that mean that everyone is automatically forgiven 
whether they trust Jesus or not? Sadly, for unbelievers, it does not mean that. What it means is that the potential is there for the whole world to take advantage of this sacrifice. It was big enough that the whole world could be saved if they took advantage of it. But it also means that Jesus' sacrifice is the only way the rest of the world has any hope of heaven. If they reject his sacrifice, they cannot be saved by any other means. There is no other means. Well, this is a world steeped in sin, and the answer lies in Jesus Christ, God's Son. No one else can save them. Without him, they're lost. Their sins will condemn them, and God's wrath will fall on them for neglecting so great a salvation. Well, Christian maturity results in knowing God. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Well, the test is simple. If we keep God's commands, then we are sure that we know him. Now, this word to know means to know by experience. We know him by opening ourselves up to his commandments and taking them into our own heart as the right thing to do. What we're doing is we're opening up our hearts to receive what is God's heart. You see, God's commandments always reflect his nature. They aren't meant to be the cold statements of law, but the living attitudes found in God himself. He wants us to be like him. If, on the other hand, a person refuses to keep God's commandments, then, then no matter how persuasive that person is with his words saying that he knows God, we can be sure that he's lying. And indeed, he cannot tell us the truth because the truth is not part of who he is. Do not listen to such men. You can't believe anything they say about God. Now, if you read scripture and you disagree with what God commands, or if you can't be bothered to read scripture, then the truth that God wants to impart to you through scripture will not be in you, and you will never really know God. God's truth is absolute truth, and we do well to accept and believe and stick by it no matter what the whole world might say that's contrary to it. Listen, if the Bible is not God's revelation to us, if it is merely the thoughts of men or a biased historical book that cannot be relied on, then throw it in the fire. Why should anyone waste their time on it? But if... It is the inspired word of God, attested by Jesus Christ, God's Son. Then burn any books that seek to undermine it or that are contrary to it. You see, the only way to know God is if he reveals himself to us. You can't reach up and, and think, it, think it through and think, I know what God is like. I'm, my brain is so great. That I, that I can fathom God? No, you can't. The only way you can know God is if he reveals himself to you. And those of us that have the Holy Spirit in us, we know that this book is the greatest treasure on earth. Until Christ saved me and gave me his Holy Spirit to enable me to call God Father, the Bible was a closed book to me. But as soon as I was saved, wow, what a difference! I could understand the Bible. The very next day after I gave my life to Jesus, I could understand what was written in the Bible. And what is so great, 
What the Bible said to me was the same as it was saying to Christians from different lands with cultures so different from mine. The Apostle Paul thought, though certain of the gospel he preached, was once concerned in case it wasn't what the other apostles were preaching. But when he at long last, he'd never met them before, but when he at long last met up with Peter and James and John, he found, yeah, we are all preaching the same message. Why? Well, simple, because they were all learning from the same Holy Spirit. It's when we start accepting human ideas that we get differences of opinion, particularly about Genesis and the book of Revelation. We have to be so careful that what is taught us is based on Scripture and Scripture alone. Commentaries can be helpful. Sometimes they can be actually harmful. But they are never authoritative. That's the reality. It is what the Bible says and what the Bible says about its own tricky passages that is authoritative. Get into the Word. So Christian maturity results in knowing God, but it also results in loving God. It says, but if anyone obeys his Word, that's God's Word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Now that phrase, God's love, can mean, <laughs> in the Greek, is of God. And so it can either be the love of God is truly made complete in him. Loving God is truly made complete in him. Or, or God's love coming into him has been made complete in him. I think it's the former of those two um, uh, that, that, is, that is, uh, is meant here because of later on in the, in the passage, we can see that that is what he's talking about, loving God. Well, you look at that passage there and, and it says, how can we determine whether we love God or not? Well, Firstly, it's not an emotional love that God requires. It's the agape love, uh, which is very practical. And so obedience is a key factor in demonstrating this love. Have I got verses five and six showing there? Or is it just verse five there? No, I have got verses five and six. Where is it going? It says, I know him. Oh, yeah, but if anyone obeys his word, that's the thing I was looking for. Yeah. But if anyone obeys his word, well, the Greek doesn't actually say that. The Greek is the word terio, and that means a better translation is if anyone keeps his word, word god's love is truly made complete in him keeping his word it is bigger than obedience um, it includes obedience but it goes beyond obedience it includes accepting what god says as the truth it, it, it is accepting his judgments as right and fair it is putting his word above all human claims to truth that do not have his word as their basis and this complete embracing of God's thoughts, God's opinions, God de God's decrees, God's commands, and God's promises is what reveals a perfect and complete agape love for God. Because it can only exist where we completely trust God and are committed to him. Do you keep God's word? Have you taken it in and you're saying, yeah, whatever God says, that's good enough for me? Because that's what it means. If God commands, then we do. 
If God promises, then we accept and we take. If God teaches, then we believe. But then he goes on, what does it mean to be in God? And do we even want to be in God? Now, it sounds a bit um, like uh, Buddhist, you know, go you know, become, get subsumed and absorbed into some big amorphous blob when you finally have got through all the reincarnation stuff and you get to the end. Do we really want to be in that? Well, no. But to be... To be in God is to be fully in his will for us, is to be living as Jesus lived. That's what it says. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And so Jesus is the answer to that question. How do we know what it is to live in God? Jesus lived it. You look at his life and you say, is that the sort of life I want? Yes, it is. I'm going to live that. We're dependent on God, just as Jesus was. We're led by God and supported and empowered by God, just as Jesus was. And so that all that we do is right in God's sight. And that's good. We should all want that. And John tells us in chapter 4, though, that to be able to live in God, God, first of all, has got to live in us. And for him to live in us means we're letting him influence our lives so that we become like him. See, if, if we're not allowing God to live in us, what are we doing? If God's in us and we're not allowing him to live in us, what are we doing? Put him in a box and trapping him and saying, no, that's as far as you can go in my life. No, that's not living, is it? Not when you're imprisoning someone like that. You've got to let them. Yes, Lord, anything you say, anything. I let you live through me. I let you live my life. And that's the question. Is it true for us? Is that how you're living? Is that how your relationship is with God? Are you letting him live through you, listening for his voice, doing what he says? Believing what he says, trusting what he says. Well, Christian maturity, I don't, yes, results in loving Christians. That's right. The words here, dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. The, this old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him, Christ, and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. John doesn't make it easy for us, does he? The message we heard in the past isn't actually explicitly mentioned here, is it? Well, you've, actually, if you read on to chapter 3 and verse 11, you find it, where we're told that the message was, and still is, that we, God's children, should love one another. Of course. We remember now, that was Christ's command to his disciples. So in what way was this old command a new command? Well, it was new because the circumstances around it had changed. It was originally given before the Spirit lived in the disciples. And now that the Spirit lives in us, it needs repeating. Because what was true in Christ and wasn't particularly necessarily true in the disciples before the Spirit came is now able to be true in us too. As we grow in grace, the darkness that once totally filled our lives, you remember what it was like before you became a Christian? Knew nothing of God, knew nothing of the truth. That was a life of darkness. But that darkness that once filled our lives is passing away. It's gradually being eaten away as God's light shines into our lives. Praise God, we're changing. We're not staying the same. 
Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. And this is addressed to Christians. It isn't addressed to people who haven't been saved by Jesus. Can we really hate a fellow believer? Unfortunately, this says, yeah, that we can. How can that be? Simple. If we're not living in God's light, we are in darkness, and we're blind to what we're really doing. You know, you can think, well, they should be being more like Jesus. And that you berate them for, for not being like Jesus when really what they need is encouragement and help. That's hating your brother. We can easily get on our high horse and start pointing at other people who are maybe had less teaching than we've had. We may think that all is well between us and God. We may know that we are saved, but we're, we're actually stumbling in the dark. Those old places where we lived in before we became Christians, because we've not let the light of the, of the scriptures shine into our lives. That is God. That is God's resource to us. And God speaks through that by his Holy Spirit. And that changes us. We're really ignorant of what it is to become, to be a Christian. Look, let God change you. Let his word into your life. Be what Christ saved you to be. Start walking as Christ walked. You don't need to stay in darkness. You don't let it, need to let it rule your behavior. The light is there. Turn into it and let it dispel the dark thoughts that were there before you met Jesus. So, for example, if you used to be arrogant, I used to be arrogant, but now I'm perfect. <laughs> if you used to be arrogant, then let God's light shine on you and help you face the truth and become humble. Let God's light expose your anger, your greed, your old ways, and find instead God's way. Christian maturity changes our focus. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. There are three stages of maturity in Christ here. Children who are immature believers, who have only just been saved, and their main focus is the fact that they have been forgiven and that they know that they are safe in Christ. Great! Then we have the young men who are beginning to live by faith and thus have overcome the lies and deceit of Satan that once allowed Satan to control them. Their focus is on living for Christ. And then we have the fathers, mature believers, who can see what is most important, and that is knowing Christ. The one who is not just human, but is from the beginning, the eternal Son of God. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. What is wonderful is that even the children know that God is their father. The spirit in us from day one makes it natural for us to call God our father. And the young men are strong. Why? Because God's word is living in their lives. And so where are you in this picture? Are you a child calling God Father and happy that you're safe now and your sins have been forgiven, but that's as far as you've got? 
Are you a young man strong? Because you have opened your life so that the light of God's word is constantly challenging and defeating Satan's worldly ways that you once lived by. Are you a father who has gone beyond concern for their own safety, has fought the good fight and put off in the majority the old ways and revels in the light of God's word and enjoys an ongoing relationship to Christ? Where do you stand? Unfortunately, Christian maturity is hindered by worldliness. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can see that's why I think earlier on, God's love should be love for God because that's what we're coming back to. That's the key thing. Who do you love? You can't love both God and mammon. Who do you love? How do we love the world? Well, by being happy to go along with the world's ways and, and changing our ways as the world changes its ways. Churches seem to be doing that great way. Yeah, yeah. Government says, do this. We say, yeah, great, let's do that. No, we don't. Not in this church anyway. We allow the world to influence what we do, how we think, what sins we condone. If we do that, we are loving the world. It becomes our master. And of course, since Satan is behind worldliness, we're in fact living according to his lies. We can't love both God and the world because they're enemies and we cannot remain neutral we have to decide on whose side we're on and be convinced that compromise is unacceptable hi uh. we're not finished and we're not going to be finished for donkey's years Right. <laughs> we can't remain neutral. We've got to decide whose side we're on. God's all the world's. And we've got to be convinced that compromise is unacceptable. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Praise God. How then do we define the world? Well, we're not talking about the globe we live on or the lost souls that inhabit this place. Remember, for God so loved the world. No. Firstly, it is the lusts of the flesh, or as the NIV puts it, the cravings of sinful man that constitute the world. In Eve's example, going right back to the very beginning, the lust of her flesh was the desire to be in God's place in her life, to rule herself and not be subject to God. Also, the lusts of the eyes are part of the world. The desire to have what we want, to have everything that we can see that attracts us. And again, our example is Eve, who saw that the forbidden fruit was tasty and would give her something she didn't have. Again, the world is made up of boasting of what we have and what we do and how great we are. But after eating the forbidden fruit, both Adam and Eve found they got nothing to boast about. And that's the reality behind much boasting. It is empty because all we have is nothing if we do not have God. And all we do is sinful until we live to serve God. Our boast must only be in Christ and what he has done for us. These things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life had their source not in how God created us, but in our first ancestors' act of rebellion against God. 
Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan, was presented with these three ways that he could take to dominate mankind rather than go to the cross and die for mankind. And he rejected all three. He said, I live for God, I don't live for the world. He rejected all three in, honor, in order to honour his Father and in order to save us. And we need to move away from our past that comes not from God, but from worldliness. We must change to be like our Father. If you had all that the world could offer you, could you take it with you when you died? No. Will you be living in this way, the way that you live now, when you enter eternity? No. These desires will not survive beyond death. Neither for those who find themselves cast into hell, nor for those who are welcomed into heaven by their saviour. No, let's do the will of God as we live now, because when we enter eternity, we'll enjoy doing God's will forever. Remember, God's will is the best. It is good. It is acceptable. It is perfect. Let's go God's way. Christian maturity. Starts with Jesus, really finishes with Jesus, doesn't it? The author and perfecter of our faith, following him, walking with him, growing with him. That's what we need. Let's pray. Father, help us to constantly be growing in Christ, becoming like him. Change our hearts so that what is most important for us is to know you. As we open ourselves to the light of your word, change us, change our attitudes, change our values, change our judgment, so that in all these we line up with you and delight to do your will. Renew our minds. Stay by us as we face the temptations of the world. Remind us that worldly ways are perishing and only your ways will last forever and bring eternal rewards. Father, we are powerless to change ourselves. And so we look to you because nothing is impossible for you and you can do far more than we can ask or imagine. Father, you are our God. And we bow before you. You have saved us from hell. Now, Lord, save us from a wasted life. For the sake of our Saviour Jesus, help us, Lord, to live worthy of him and of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Well, time is rushing on, and so that you're not here for the donkey's lives, uh, we'll go straight into uh, our time of communion. That is important to remember Christ, to come near to him. And so we shall skip this uh, next hymn and... Uh, Turn to the words of institution given to us by the Apostle Paul. And he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, here and now, the Lord Jesus is calling everyone who loves him to take part in this ceremony so that by eating the bread and drinking the wine, we may be reminded of his great love for us as seen in his death for us. Come, not because you must, but because you may. Come, not because you're worthy, but because you have received grace and want to honour your Saviour.
For each of us who, who belong to Jesus, there is a strong warning, which I didn't go on to read, but basically if we are harboring a grudge against another of God's children, then we're putting a barrier between ourselves and Christ. To receive him, we must receive all who belong to him. To love him, we must love every other member of his body. Remember, that's Christian maturity. Love your brothers and sisters. To receive forgiveness and cleansing from him, we must forgive others. So if you need to forgive another, or you need to ask forgiveness from another, then until you have sorted that out, coming to this table will do you more harm than good, and you will have no fellowship with Christ. With those who are serving, please uh, come to the, uh, to the front, please. Let's uh, pray, give thanks for the symbols that are before us. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for giving us a means to remember Jesus. Lord Jesus, well, of course, we ought to thank you because you're the one who actually instituted this. But we know, Lord, it's from you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you. We thank you as we take the bread. It reminds us that Jesus Christ's body was broken upon the cross for us. He gave his whole being, Lord, that we might be saved, that we might be, become part of that body and belong to one another and truly care for each other. Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you for the wine. The wine that reminds us of bloods, of Christ's blood that was poured upon the earth. Only your blood can wash away the stain of our sin. Lord, we know how deep that stain is. Individually, we know the, the depth of wickedness in our own hearts. And we thank you for the cleansing blood of Christ pictured for us in the wine that we will drink. So, Lord, we want to say thank you and ask that you will bless this ceremony and these elements to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So after Christ gave thanks for the bread, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I hand these to you. Thank you. Uh, we'll eat as we receive. Christ's body was sacrificed for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
After supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We'll hold on to the cup so that we can all drink together, remembering that we are one body. This is actually kind of the opposite of how it would have been for the, the Christians early on, because they would have drunk out of one cup, and you can't always drink, you can't drink that. Oh, oh bang there. Sorry about that. You couldn't do that, could you? But we can, we can do it this way around, whereas you could eat the bread at the same time. We are one bread, one body. And sorry, I can't reach that far. Thank you. So we'll drink together. We can take it as a sign of our unity, as a sign that Christ has accepted each one of us by his blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. How wonderful. I like it when um, the, the, the wine is offered to me and then I offer it back to the person because you're the hand of Christ, part of the body of Christ. You're the hand of Christ. So when, when I receive this from someone, or the bread as well, I'm receiving it from Christ. Well, Christ's blood was shed for you to make you holy. To cleanse you from all sin by his blood, you also have that privilege of coming into the very presence of God. So drink and be thankful. Amen. Well, we're singing our closing song. It's a great one. There is a hope that burns within my heart. Thank you. 
blessing over each other in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 Spirit. Please. 